Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new let's play of Democracy 4. Democracy 4 is a successor to Democracy 3 that was released in 2013 and heavily featured on my channel. Now the game is a strategy slash simulation in which you take control of an entire government and you try to bring the nation as close to, if not to, perfection as you can. Now, it is actually kind of hard to explain the game in any other way than to actually play it, so that's what I'm uh, gonna do in this first uh, playthrough. I'm gonna choose the hardest nation that is currently featured in the game, and in this first episode I'm gonna explain how the mechanics work and show you a couple of examples if we can get to it. Now, uh, a fair warning, it is just coming into early access today, so a number of features will be added, and if you are watching this later than uh, in the current month, which is October 2020, wow, time flies, uh, then the game might look a bit different or might show you some things that I am not showing here. So without further ado, let's start with the game. So, we currently have five nations, uh, Canada has been added today, uh, so I haven't played it, but out of these, United States of America, United Kingdom, Germany and France, France is the hardest one. I have played all of them and with the exception of France, they all were actually kind of easy. Even France is not that difficult. But I found the Germany especially easy. So if you will be buying the game and trying to learn the ropes a bit, I suggest this game is your uh, first pick because it is it is relatively very easy. So France. France, or the French Republic, was an absolute monarchy at the time of the French Revolution in 1789. In 1792, with the motto Liberty, Equality and Fraternity, France became one of the earliest modern republics. It took another 80 years for France to become a democracy. Even then, democratic rights were sometimes derailed, including during World War II, and it wasn't until the Fifth Republic was established in 1958 that the democratic rule stabilized. France has an elected president and a prime minister appointed by the president. France is a leading member of the European Union and a member of NATO. Well, I like how they <laughs> did not mention that France actually went out of the NATO and then came back. Uh, never mind. Population. 65,273,511 people. Size. 643,801 square kilometers. Religion, Catholicism 41%, none 40%, Islam 5%. Exports, machinery, aircraft, vehicles, pharmaceuticals, plastics, cosmetics and beverages. World leader, luxury goods, tourism, welfare state funding, exporting electricity. Member of Eurozone, EU single market, NATO and G4 and national obsession in gastronomy, equality, wine, and competitive cycling, also known as Tour de All of France. <laughs> so, we are going to start the game here. We need to choose our own uh, party name. I kind of like the, where is it, the National Technocrats party, because that's how I usually try to play the game. Opposition party... I guess it could be the Labour League if we go with the the Freedom Brigade, Jesus Christ. Or the Egalitarian Republicans. No, I usually tend to favor Egalitarian uh, Republic, so the Labour League. And uh, the other one is going to be the Social Justice Party. You can put on compulsory voting if you feel like it, which will force everyone in, uh, well, everyone eligible to vote. Or you can turn off three parties and you're just gonna have one competing party. But I'm gonna keep with the three parties. We're gonna have a difficulty of 100%, political apathy of 51, 
which is the preset value, innate socialism 100%, innate liberalism 100%. This does not mean that uh, the socialism or liberalism will be at 100%, but it uses the default uh, functions that are there. Economic cycle 20%, which means we are starting at a relatively bad time, which kind of corresponds with uh, the current situation in the world. Uh, you could manually put it up or down, uh, it goes from very bad to very good, meaning, you know, 0 to 1. I actually think it goes 0 to 100, yeah. So let's put it back to 20. And starting that, again, I'm going to use the preset value, which is extremely high. And that's going to be one of the major issues that we will have. So with all of this set, I think we can start playing the game. So we're memorizing pop culture, something, and we are here. Congratulations on your election victory. Welcome to your new job as president. The lives of all 65,272,000 citizens are now in your hands. As you will imagine, there are a number of situations and concerns that you will need to deal with as soon as possible, while keeping an eye on the long-term improvements of our citizens' quality of life. Plus, do not forget that you face re-election in five years, so you will need to monitor the opinion polls and our party membership. Good luck. So, five years might seem like a long time, but it is not. I say that pretty confidently it is not. So, this is what is going to show up with each of the countries, and if you're playing any other, uh, or any other of the ones that I have available right now, uh, as a side note, the game is extremely easy to mod, so for Democracy Free, I played Serbia, I played the Czech Republic, I played Russia, Korea, there are so many mods for Democracy Free, and I'm hoping that they will feature many uh, countries, like Somalia and other <laughs> in Democracy 4. I actually feel like maybe even joining the modding community. Anyway, back to the game. Uh, these are the main indicators of your country. What it means is that our GDP is actually not really doing good, uh, which corresponds with the fact that we have an overall very high unemployment, quite a lot of crime. The health is good, the education is great, and poverty is low, but the GDP is our biggest problem. Now, I say this because when you get into the actual uh, gameplay screen, you are invited with the overall numbers up here. We have an income of 122.62 billion euros every um, turn, and we have expenses of 149.04 billion euros, which puts us at a deficit of 26.42 billion euros every turn. And we have a debt of 2.46 trillion, which as you can see is just steadily rising. Now, the game doesn't really um, forces you to deal with this issue at the very start of the game, but having balanced finances is extremely important and it's going to be the core issue of my policies. Now, you well, as a, as a whole, uh, the public finances are extremely important. And if you keep running at a debt, as pretty much every country in the world is right now, uh, you will eventually have to deal with it. What I mean here is that we can look at the incomes, expenditures of our government, and you can see that the debt interest itself now per every turn is 10.47 billion uh, euros, which is 7% of our overall expenses. That's insane. So out of this uh, debt, we are paying, what was it, 7 billion? No, 10.47, so 1 12th of our income goes to just paying uh, the interest on our debt. That's crazy. That's the worst thing uh, on playing France, that you start with a very tight budget. Now, there are other very bad things, but it will take me a bit of time to go through them, so bear with me. Let me just take a sip of my tea, and we can start. Now, you are invited with uh, these 
um, kind of chaotic symbols. I can say that for a stunning player it can be a bit overwhelming, but the situation is as this. It's divided into quadrants. You have transport policies here, foreign policies, welfare policies, economy policies, tax policies, public services, and law and order policies. I think I started with transport, hopefully. And this is how you basically govern. You take policies in these categories and you enact them or cancel them or modify them. And each of these policies is having a certain effect on your nation. Now, at the very first glance, you can see that there are basically three categories. There could be four, but we don't have the one that I will mention now. There are uh, the basic... How would I call them? These are like triggers. Uh, no, not triggers, not triggers. These are the... Um, wow. I should have thought of a good word for these. I would call them situations. So, for example, we have a car usage here, a bus usage, uh, we have rail usage, we have the GDP of our country. So, these things are just the basic facts about your country. The level of crime, uh, the amount of health your people have, and stuff like that. And these all are influenced by other things. So, the blue ones are just the things that are. Uh, the re the gray green ones, gray green, and yeah, gray green ones are the policies that are actually currently enacted. So, for example, here we can see the police force. We have a working police force. Here we can see state pensions. Here we can see that's probably state health service. Yes, and these also affect the current situation, but they affect each other as well. So, for example, if I look at a certain one, let's look, for example, at the car usage that I already hovered over. You can see that there are some green lines and some red lines. Red lines mean that the car usage is negatively affecting these things or is negatively affected by these things. And the green ones mean positive effect. So, for example, the height of car usage is positively affecting the oil demand, logically, but is negatively affecting the bus and the rail usage, of course, because the more people drive cars, the less of them drive buses. You can see here that there are also, however, very negatively affected, or very negatively, well, negatively affected by the bicycle subsidies that we have uh, enacted right now. So, they are the more people are on bikes, the less sit in cars, and that goes for buses and rails as well. Plus, bicycle subsidies positively affect the overall health of the population because more people spend moving on bikes, the healthier they are. There are, however, uh, two more categories that need to be taken into consideration, and those are the positive and the negative situations. We, unfortunately, have only the negatives. We have a number of them. <laughs> oh boy. So, these are the red ones. So, there's one called Rail Strike. Rail Strike is an actual situation that is causing quite a lot of problems in our country. Uh, as you can see, it negatively affects almost everything. Uh, well, actually, yeah, it negatively affects only the GDP. You can click on these as well to see uh, the same things here. So, uh, the rail strike is affected by labor laws, poor earnings, state rail company. So, there is something wrong with the funding of the rail company and overall unemployment. So, these cause the rail strike and that in turn hurts the commuters' opinion of you and the GDP. So you need to you need to understand some situations are unavoidable, some can be lived with, but we have a number of them. For example, the street gangs are way worse than the rail uh, rail strike. You can see that the effect is very negative on quite a lot of people, on the conservatives, on everyone, on retired or uh, or their on their uh, or on the population's view of me as a strong leader and on tourism, and it increases crime and violent crime. Yeah, but street gangs are uh, definitely coming from a large-scale poverty that's in our country and from the unemployment. So if we can cut these off, 
uh, we can resolve the street gangs and get rid of them. Apart from rail strike and street gangs, we also have a doctor strike. We have a respiratory disease epidemic, and we have hospital overcrowding. Plus, we have two more here in the economy which hurt us the most, and one of them is called corporate exodus, and the other one is called uncompetitive economy. Now, both of these negatively affect our GDP, which is really bad. Really, really, really bad. And there's also quite a lot of things that is actually affecting the corporate exodus. So, yeah, it's not going to be easy to get rid of. It's going to take a lot of time. Now, apart from the negative situations, there are also positive situations, but you can see we don't have any right now. We don't have any at all. Uh, France is not in a good place at the start of the game. Well, so that is the system of the game. Now, what does this part mean? Uh, this shows my overall popularity with the groups which are written here. There's actually a very intricate and detailed uh, overview of each of the country population group. So we have the capitalist commuters. As you can see, uh, it, the game shows you what is affecting each of the people group, people group, <laughs> or, the, or the group of voters, commuters. We have the conservatives. We have environmentalists, which are very happy with the way things are in France. They pretty much just don't like the road building and nuclear fission. Other than that, they are happy with everything. Uh, there's ethnic minorities. There's everyone, which is a special like most important group uh, we have farmers liberals we have middle income we have motorists we have parents we have patriots we have poor people religious we have retired we have the self-employed we have the socialists which are also very happy with me state and police also very happy we have the trade unionists welfare and the youth now these are just the groups uh, organized by their name, but you can also look at the amount of uh, the people in your country in each group. So we have, for example, everyone here, which is, of course, pretty much everyone. But most people in our country are actually in the middle income group, and we are not that popular. The good news, though, is that socialists are the third largest group in our country. Now, you probably already guessed that, but each of the people in our country can fall into more than one group. Uh, some are exclusive uh, or some groups exclude other groups. So for example, a voter cannot be both um, say socialist and liberal or oh, well, he could I don't, um, no, I don't think it can be so. Well, he can be liberal and conservative at the same time. He could be socialist and liberal, I think. Uh, but he can, for example, be retired and youth, or he cannot be poor and uh, middle income. So these some some groups exclude, exclude other. But you can easily have a middle income socialist, motorist, uh, trade unionist, religious farmer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, as you uh, as you can guess, uh, if you manage to keep the largest group in your country happy, you will be doing well. So if we keep our middle income and socialists happy and don't really screw up with everyone, uh, we are pretty much okay. Same with the liberals. Uh, the least important ones at this point are wealthy and patriots, which is kind of weird. I often thought that people in France are kind of patriotic. Uh, let's check out what's going on here. You can look at each of the groups. Yeah, so only less than 10% of the people are patriotic. Uh, their membership is keeping steady. Uh, racial tensions are lowering their, their group membership, but foreign relations are improving it and citizenship tests are improving that. Okay, their happiness is affected by the current policies that you can see here. There's also income, but that one, I'm not entirely sure how how to read that. The happiness distribution is also kind of important and I'm gonna explain why. You can't really make 
any of the groups in your country hate you 100%. The reason for that are the terrorist groups. If you really piss off one of the groups, they might try to assassinate you. I had a huge problem with this in Democracy Free for pretty much all the time the religious were after me. In Democracy 4, I feel like they have toned it down a bit. I had some threats and I had some um, groups come after me at certain points in the game. But nothing really crazy really happened. Uh, I was always able to, to deal with each of the groups. Now, again, uh, one thing that's worth noting. If we look, for example, at the religious... I already mentioned this, but just so you know, there are different ways how to influence the membership of your groups. So, for example, if you wanted to go to the extremes, you can almost eliminate certain groups in your country. Uh, say you want to eradicate eradicate the poor. Uh, I don't mean by killing them, but you can in, you can lower their membership by uh, promoting. Well, GDP and, and well, I don't think you can actually remove the poor, but you can, for example, remove the religious, or you can remove farmers, or there's a lot of uh, policies that influence the membership of the liberals, for example. You can see that the violent crimes, street gangs, stability, right to privacy, there's a lot of effects um, that they deal with and that affects their membership. So if you focus on certain groups in your game, uh, it is also important to focus on their membership and you can pretty much negate some of the groups that you put to the back. This is for me uh, usually the religious. I myself am very, very uh, science-based person. I don't really, um, you know, I'm, I'm not religious at all. And most of the policies that are in the game are, you know, pretty straightforward. So I tend to either, uh, not not fighting. I don't. I'm not. Oh my god! This is probably gonna kill kill the comment section. But uh, I'm not trying to negate uh, the religious. Uh, how would I put it? I'm just not. I'm just not uh, supporting. The religious group in the game so they usually start dropping pretty dramatically in my games uh, but that does not mean I don't protect their freedoms I'm just not really interested in having that group which is kind of interesting because France has quite a lot of people in the religious group almost 30 percent of the socialists I expect that's yeah that's neither is 60 and middle income is wow 75 percent of the people in France are considered middle income. That's kind of interesting. Okay, I'm gonna go through these uh, now and we'll call it day after that and start playing in the episode two, which will come right after this video. Uh, I'm sorry I'm taking so much time to explain how this game works, but it's kind of important that you understand what's going on in the game and that you can see what I'm doing without doubting or or getting lost in you know because a lot of the times we'll be looking at graphs like these speaking about what it does and how it affects our country so these principles need to be very uh, not realistic but very easy to read for you so anyway uh, you can change the graphs that you can see here there's currently set to weighted we can look at the finances which will prior which will uh, change the size of the bubble based on how much finances we are pouring into things it's pretty much the things that we have seen wait we have seen here expenditures and income so you can see that the income tax and state pensions are the most important things here's the income tax and here are the state pensions there's also wait this is the income tax this is payroll tax okay but that should be right behind it. Yeah, okay. So these are the three biggest investments and uh, well, this is an in this is an expenditure, this is an income that we have. Uh, you can also change it by value, uh, which shows you which things are hard to change and which things are not hard to change. Uh, influence, which <laughs> shows you basically how the things affect each other uh, 
GDP affects pretty much everything and is affected pretty much by everything. It's one of the most important stats in the game. So yeah, that's the biggest one. Then you have policy popularity, which shows you which things are seen as good and which things are seen as bad. Interesting, legalized sex work is seen... Ah, yeah, because religious people hate that. Okay, that's the reason. There's also the property tax, which middle, wealthy, retired, and generation... Well, no, this is not a group. No, but middle earnings, high earnings... Holy hell, capitalists, middle income, wealthy, retired, and generation... I said it again, but yeah, there's a lot of groups that hate it. Socialists and equality is positively affected by this. Uh, you can see the slider down here. You can change the way uh, how your country is affected by policies by changing the actual level of certain things. So, for example, if we lower this from 66% to, well, I'll say 50, it would have absolutely no effect on the welfare anymore. And it would kind of cut on the other ones quite significantly. If we went to zero, it would negate all of the effects, uh, but our income would drop from 7.65 billion every turn to 782 <laughs> million. Uh, it's kind of interesting though that this does not uh, at all affect the GDP. I'm kind of surprised. If we actually went higher than where we are now, for example, from 66 to 76, you oh you can't even go higher than 75. You can see that the effect on the wealth is pretty much tripled. So not all uh, policies have an equal effect on you know on each of the level it's not it's not always linear so we need to be wary of that and yeah we looked at the finances i keep it on rated most of the time uh but well, we'll see i am i wanted to play with this a bit then there's a number of graphs that you can see here uh voting intentions is how many people uh, want to vote, it will change uh, based on how many people like you and how many hate you. Here's disposable income, which is a lot of data, but I actually didn't find any usage for this other than some nice reading. Voter types, uh, these show you how many, uh, you know, this, this is just another uh, graph for the amount of people in your country. There's focus groups. You can look at various uh, representations of your um, of your um, population, various representatives of your population. Yes, I'm saying it right. So, for example, if we click on this guy, he kind of likes us. His approval is uh, over 63.5 percent because he's an environmentalist. He likes us. He's an everyone. He's a middle income and youth. He's a patriot. A bit. And trade units. Wow, actually, that's interesting. I did not realize before they don't even have to be fully in a group. He's also a bit socialist, a state employee, liberal, and a commuter. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, so they, they made it even, even more detailed by adding a varying level of influence. Okay, live and learn, I guess. Changes. Uh, we have done none. And then there's the political compass. Uh, which is kind of fun because it will track your progression through the game on the actual compass so you can see how you are moving. I, fair warning, I usually end up somewhere here. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You'll see. Okay, uh, then there's the financial da data, which we've already seen. There are some charts, income, we'll deal with this. Uh, in the next episode. This is how you enact policies. Now one thing that I haven't mentioned is this. We get extra political capital from our ministers that you can see here. They each uh, like us on a varying degree. They each have some experience and effectiveness. And he will give us a varying amount of political capital every turn. Right now we have 18, so we can change a certain policy. For example, we can cancel the state pensions. We could lower them by this much, sacrificing all of our uh, political power. Or we can increase them. Well, actually, not, not all of it. 
you can see that we would be left with one, but yeah, it would cost us 40 to cancel the entire policy. So that's actually kind of drastic, but yeah, it's state pensions, canceling them is a drastic step. So uh, you use the diplomatic, use the political capital to change your current policies or to enact new policies. Uh, we can see some, there are some hidden that will become available based on the things that you do in the game and based, um, based on which you enact and in which uh, or on what level you will spend your political capital. Uh, again, they are divided between the categories that you saw here, so you can basically navigate yourself based on that. Then there's some achievements. Uh, here's the cabinet ministers. I already spoke about that. And the other things here are just the settings and stuff like that. So this has been a long and arduous introduction into Democracy 4, but in the next episode we are going to actually start tweaking the game. Sorry, again, it has been long, but I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining these details in the next episode where we are going to play, because I need you to understand how or what I'm trying to achieve when I say I'm doing this or that. So hopefully you will uh, accept my apology for the very detailed description, and in the next episode, when we start playing, I hope that you guys will uh, kind of catch on on what I'm doing. If you, of course, have any questions, post them in the comments below. I will be happy to answer them. And I will see you in the next episode where we actually start playing. So, see you there.